So I want to start this morning by reading a quote to you that I found on Facebook, a great source of information and knowledge, I know. Um, but I, I think you'll find this encouraging, and I think it's really appropriate for what we've been doing, walking through the book of Colossians. This is actually a quote from a famous pastor who has now passed away named R.C. Sproul. Here's something that he said. He said, the church needs reformation when it believes it has had enough of Jesus. And so that's, that's a, striking, um, a striking thing to say, but it really is appropriate considering who and what we're studying in the book of Colossians, and that is Christ. The book of Colossians is so rich, and the point of the whole book is to say that Jesus is everything. He's everything. He's, our, he's the head of our church. He's the head of our lives. He is the whole point of our existence. And if we're going to be a biblical church, we want to preach Jesus Jesus, Jesus, without compromise. And so this morning, I want to I want to tell you a, a quick, not really a story, but kind of give you an illustration, um, and it's going to kind of set the tone for what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, if you go to the nursery, the plant nursery, and you buy a small sapling tree, maybe you buy a bush or maybe a pre-grown, uh, you know, tomato plant or something. You know, and I'm not, just so you know, full disclosure, I'm not a gardener. I don't really know a lot, but I know this much. You come home and you go in your yard or, uh, you know, the pot that you're going to plant it in, and you take your little trowel and you, you dig out a hole, and then you take that plant, that little baby plant, and you pick it up and it's got its root ball here, and you plant that sucker right in the soil, right? And you press it down firm, and then what do you do next? You pack all that soil around it, right? You make sure it's really firm. You make sure that it's rooted securely in place. And then after you do that, some people, uh, I was taught you kind of make a little channel around it, right? And then you make sure you give it copious amounts of water and make sure that it's really nourished. And then over the next couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, depending on the plant, you're going to do different things, right? You might fertilize it. You might give it a little bit of uh, help, you know, nourishing it. So it'll grow. Maybe you're going to go and continue to water it more than you will later when it's fully grown. You know, if it's a if it's a larger tree, maybe you want to make sure that it grows straight. So you go and you trim off the little the little water. What do they call the little water sucker roots? You know, that come out of the bottom. You don't want them. So you, you go and you prune it and you snip it off. And maybe you even put a little pole and you tie it around to make sure that it grows straight up. But eventually, what happens is after you've rooted it and you've watered it and you've kind of nurtured it, those roots take hold, don't they? they? They grow deep into the soil, and they grow down. And after a few years, you really, you really can't do much to help it. It is established, isn't it? That tree, that plant, that, that bush, it has its own roots. The storms can come, you know, the, the lightning storms that we had this summer, you know. Actually, some of our big trees here didn't last very well. But in general, it's not going to it's not going to be ripped out. It's going to be firmly planted, and it's going to continue to grow up to reach the sun. That is really an analogy for our lives as Christians. And that's what this series is all about. And so we're going to unpack that today uh, in, our, in our sermon text. And, and you look up here, our series is titled Rooted, Walking, and Growing. We're rooted in Christ. We're watered by Christ, and we grow in Christ. So today we're going to go uh, through uh, four verses. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 4 to 7 today. Verses 4 to 7. And as you're turning there, here's what I want us to get from the sermon today. Don't be fooled by the enemy's fake news. The devil wants to take our focus off of Christ at all costs. Rely on your training and continue to be on mission for the kingdom of God. That's what we need to learn today. Don't be fooled by fake news. Keep your focus on Christ. The mission for the kingdom of God is what we need to be about. So verse 4 begins this. Paul says, 
I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. So Paul is making the statement, I'm saying this so. He's telling the Colossians, be encouraged, be encouraged. Things are going good, but you need to stay alert. You need to be cautious because there is an enemy and that enemy is looking at you to find a weak spot, isn't he? And he's trying to come to you to take your eyes off of the prize that you've already received, which is Jesus Christ. He says, I'm saying this. Well, if you've been here in the past week, you know that what Paul's talking about is everything he said in this letter before, specifically who Christ is. Paul takes more than half of the letter to in great detail describe to the Colossians and to us today who the person of Jesus Christ is. And this is what we would call doctrine, right? That, that really like boring word that you hear it and whether you're a Christian or not, whatever field you're in, you hear a word like doctrine and you're like, oh man, snooze fest, right? But not when Paul talks about it. When we hear the doctrine of Christ, which is the reality of who he is, the perfect person in the finished work, we shouldn't feel that sense of like boring. We should be like, yes, let me hear who my Savior is. Let me get a little bit better of a glimpse on the glory of the person of Christ because without him, I would be nothing. And so what he's told them in summary is this. Here's who Jesus is. He told them that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Meaning that he is God. He's not just a man. He's not a spirit. He is literally God in the flesh. Paul taught the Colossians that the fullness of God, all that God is, was in Jesus Christ. He said that Jesus was before all things. He is eternal. And so let me clarify that a little bit. He's not eternal in the sense that he was born of a virgin like he was in real time in history on earth. And that is going to live forever. That's not eternal. Eternal is he existed eternity past and will exist eternity future. There was no beginning and there is no end for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is God. Amen. If your brain hurts, it should. We're not made to understand these things. Paul also reminds them that Jesus Christ is the head of his church. And his church is each Christian with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That means no priest, no pastor, no figurehead of any kind has true authority over the church, but only Jesus. And every leader in the church is really just an under-shepherd, an understudy, an intern, right? We're, we're training wheels, keeping the seat warm for when Christ comes back again to reign perfectly for all of eternity future. And then he said Christ was the first to be resurrected. The idea of resurrecting from the dead was not new to the Jewish people. Some Jews didn't believe in it, others did. But the Bible speaks about this long distant point in the future when somehow all the people that have died in all of human history would rise from the dead and be united in some way with God. That's what the Old Testament taught in shadows and in ambiguity. But then Christ comes and he reveals the great mystery that God had always planned. That all the dead will rise and there will be a judgment. And that judgment is all of those who have put their faith in Christ would bend the knee in joy and gratitude and worship to Jesus the King who will then live on earth in perfection forever. But the others, of course, they will bend the knee because they can't help it. Because Christ is sovereign and Lord and they will be rightly judged with perfect justice for an eternity of judgment. And so Christ was the first one to be resurrected from the dead. The first one. That's important. He didn't die again. He's still alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. So that's who the person of Christ is in a nutshell. This is what he told them. And then Paul goes on to say what Christ did. And quite simply stated, he made peace between man and God. That was the perfect person of Jesus Christ, right, who he is, 
and the finished work, what he did. He made peace between man and God. He reconciled a sinful people to himself by the shedding of his blood that we're going to celebrate this morning after our potluck meeting. He lived that perfect life, set the perfect example, was the most innocent of, of any existing creature, and allowed himself to be put to death for the crimes that you and I committed. That's what he did. And then Paul finishes by telling them that he is not telling them this because he's a self-appointed celebrity preacher or some holier-than-thou guy that has more spiritual muscle than you do. Paul has been commissioned by God to deliver this message. And he says that you can trust me not because I have degrees or because I have money or I'm a smooth talker. You can trust me because not only did God appoint me, but I'm suffering for his name, and it's contrary to what you would think an elevated person would look like. Paul's mission is not to make himself fully known and himself celebrated. His mission is to make God's word fully known. That's what he said in chapter 1 in the beginning of 2. And he wants to teach all Christians to grow and be mature in Christ. So Paul is saying, look, if it was about me, why would I be giving everything of myself for you? I'm only doing what the Lord Christ gave as an example in a far inferior way. In other words, Paul is telling them, here's who Christ is so you know the real McCoy. Here's what he did so you know that you're, you're good. You're good to go. And then here's what a real minister of the gospel looks like. Don't be fooled. He wants them to know the real pattern. Why? Because fake news sells. We hear that word all the time. Fake news sells. Why does it sell? Well, you know, you go on the internet or you watch TV and you see or you hear a headline that is just too, like, it's either too good to be true or it's too bad to be true, right? Sometimes we want to hear what's too bad to be true first. Who here remembers that picture that went around on the internet of some wound and it looked like a bunch of little bubbles and eggs and stuff in it? And it turns out it was just a picture of a pomegranate. Right? It was totally fake. I mean, this is important because it's not just an anecdote for where we are today. Fake news called different things, has been the, the biggest tool of the enemy since the Garden of Eden. What did Satan himself say to Adam and Eve? He said, you surely will not die. Fake news. If you eat that fruit of the tree, you will be like God. Fake news, right? But didn't they like to hear it? And don't we like to hear it? Whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're in the middle, you're at the far right, the far left, whatever part of the political sphere you are, when somebody speaks to what you want to hear and they add a little of their own special sauce in it that might not be true, don't you want to eat more of it? I know I do. I binge on political news junkies on YouTube, right? Not all of it's true on any side. We're always looking for that deceptive thing because it, it feeds our flesh. It says in verse 4, so that no one will be, I'm sorry, excuse me, let me say this. So that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. So Paul is saying this, all that came before, so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. Doesn't that sound like what fake news is? Deceptive arguments that sound true, that sound reasonable? A used car salesman maybe comes to mind. Let me tell you why you need to buy this car with the wheels falling off for a price that's too high. This is the thesis and purpose of Paul's letter. This is the point. This is why he wrote to the Colossians. All four chapters right here in this statement. So that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. This is true spiritual warfare, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is serious business with what Paul is talking about. Satan is actively opposing the church. And has been since it started and will until Christ chains him for an eternity in his own special kind of hell. A side note, Satan will not be in the hell with all the people. He'll be in his own hell. He's not some, you know, other ruler of the dark side partying with all the sinners. He will suffer more than any creature that ever existed because of what he did to God. Know that. He's God's devil. God created him. God will punish him. So this spiritual warfare, we, we don't like to talk about it in the church, or we use it anecdotally, right? Our car breaks down, man, that's spiritual warfare. Couldn't get myself to work today, you know? Or like in our house, it seems like every Saturday night there's an emergency, 
right? I, I either cut my arm running like an idiot at 11 o'clock at night, or like last night our washer leaked and leaked down into the basement, or a pipe burst, or whatever. Maybe it's spiritual warfare, maybe it's not. But what Paul's talking about here, this is it. You want to know what it looks like when the devil attacks? It's not like the horror movies with spinning heads and vomiting people. It's not haunted houses. It's not demons appearing. It's taking your eyes off of Christ. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't care if you believe in him. He cares that you don't believe in Christ. And if you do believe in Christ, he wants to make you as miserable as you possibly can be and fool you into thinking that you are not good enough. Well, newsflash, we're not. Only Christ is. And when Christ has redeemed us, we are free and victorious, and we have no reason to fear any evil. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9 says this, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering, sufferings, are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Paul wasn't alone in thinking this way. Deception is the main tool of Satan's demonic forces. We know that Satan is described in Scripture as the great deceiver and the father of lies. Jesus himself says it in John 8. He says in verse 44, he's talking to some false teachers, right? And here's what Jesus says to them. He says, you are your father, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He, meaning the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. This is serious business, and Paul knows that the Colossians are exceptionally vulnerable. Why? Because they are in Christ and they're doing the right things. If you're not looking at Christ, the devil doesn't want any part of you. But if you're in Christ and you're growing closer to Christ, you're doing the things that Christ commands, you're gathering with Christ's people, he is going to try to frustrate you, he is going to try to deceive you, and it's not going to be obvious, it's going to be subtle. Today is no different in terms of this lion roaming around looking for victims. This is no different in the case of, uh, you know, false teachers telling us things that we want to hear and taking our focus on what's important. First Timothy, and by the way, Timothy was Paul's protege, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2 says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, we're in later times, just so you know, in later times some will depart from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose conscience are seared. The teachings of demons. Sounds dark, doesn't it? Here's a teaching of demons, ready? Jesus is not the only way. That's not a very scary statement, right? We hear that on Oprah Winfrey, quite frankly, right? We hear that all over. Satan doesn't need to scare you. He doesn't need to. He just needs to get one little deceptive thought in your head that causes you to not put Christ first in your front frontal vision. Right? That's what he does. Fake news takes our focus off of the truth, and the truth is Jesus. Fake news speaks to our flesh. That's, I mean, it's so insidious. We hear it, and we want to hear more. It talks to what we want in our Sinful part of our body, not in our safe part of our body. It's fake news makes us focus on ourselves and on man, on worldly things, right? Puts us into camps. I'm with this tribe. I'm with that tribe. I'm with this group and that group. You make up tribes that don't even exist. Fake news seems reasonable because it's mixed with truth. It has just enough to make you think that's the real thing. It's kind of like my coffee. Right? I don't want to use sugar because I don't want to get fat. It doesn't work. I'm still getting fat. But I put Splenda in, right? Because I want it to taste like the real thing. That's what Satan does. He, he deceives us by putting a little bit of that truth, a little bit of that sweetness in there. And we think, man, we can buy this whole thing. <laughs> and most importantly, fake news 
decreases Jesus in our eyes and increases man. It makes Jesus seem less important and man, meaning the human species, more important. But see, Paul is not fussing at the Colossians and he's not fussing at us, born again believers. He's saying you need to know this reality. You need to know what the real Jesus is. You need to know where you stand with him. And you need to know of the dangers. Because listen, Paul is showing long distance love for the Colossians. He says, for I may be absent in body. Paul was imprisoned in Rome when he wrote this letter. He was imprisoned not because he committed a crime, but because he was speaking the very truth that he's telling them to hold on to. He knows firsthand the spiritual battle that is going to happen because he's suffering it right now or in that whole point in time. Paul is a vast distance from Rome. Did you know from where Colossae is, which is in the Lycus Valley in the country of Turkey today, to Rome in a straight line is about 930 miles? In, the, in that time, that, that can seem like an insurmountable distance. And yet he loves the Colossians so much, he writes a letter and hands it to a man that had to walk all 930 miles to hand it to them to be read in that church. That's a successful long-distance relationship with these girls, right? No cell phones. Can you imagine? No FaceTime? Hey, it's Paul. You want to FaceTime? Nope, busy. Click. They didn't have that. His affection for the Colossians was no less than if he was there with them in the community. This can only happen with born-again believers. It's a fraternity of faith, isn't it? It's a fraternity of faith. Because Paul says... I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit. He's saying, I've got your back. I've got your back. He's with them, not physically, but he's there with them thoughtfully. Clearly, we read this letter and we read the letters that Paul writes to all these churches. He is thinking about them constantly. And quite frankly, he's in prison. So God has put him in a place where he can, right? And, and he's with them emotionally. He said in chapter one how he was rejoicing for them, right? In other letters you read, he says he's weeping for them. In other letters, he says, I've heard the way you're doing it wrong, and I'm mad about it, right? He's invested with them, and he's prayerfully with them. Not only does he write that he's praying for them, but we know the example of Paul. He is on his knees, constantly praying for these people that he's never met, 930 miles away. And he's with them, and this is important, economically. What? Did he send them money? No. But listen, writing the letter... Don't, mis don't mistake this. Writing the letter was a big deal at this time in history. Paper was not, you couldn't go down the store to the Dollar General and buy some paper. You know, it was expensive. And it wasn't paper. It was on some kind of animal hide or some sort of papyrus. I mean, you had to actually have a lot of wealth to be able to write something down. People didn't have books everywhere in their house for decoration. They'd have to go to somewhere that had maybe one copy of something in the whole hundred some mile radius, right? So the fact that Paul's using this resource to actually write the letter and then get one of his people that works with him to say, I need you to take several months or a year to walk there and deliver it, that's economically invested. Paul's with them. He's with them in spirit. He's with them thoughtfully. He's in it to win it with all believers. And then he says... I did not skip a page. Sorry about that. <laughs> he says, you've received a Lord, right? Remember in verse 6 we just read, uh, no, you know what, guys? Forgive me. I make mistakes all the time. I turned the page over before I got to my next note. So we're going to start again. You ready? Okay. I am not perfect, right? Far from it. Actually, my son is like, yeah, we know that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I can tell everybody how imperfect you are, right? Now. <laughs> so he's absent in body, but he's with them in spirit. He's with them in spirit. And listen, the report was awesome. See, he knows about what's happening because Epaphras, his disciple that he made, was the one that preached the gospel in Colossae. He went all the way to Rome to tell Paul about the church. He went all the way to Rome. And so Paul was rejoicing to see how well ordered that they were, and the strength of their faith in Christ. That's what it says in the last part of verse 5. Now when he says they're well-ordered, this is actually a military term. It gives the idea of standing shoulder to shoulder, 
right? Not just shoulder to shoulder hanging out by the fire because it was cold, but shoulder to shoulder ready for action. They were united. They were united in purpose, and that was the kingdom. He's telling the Colossians, man, you are ready. You are well ordered. You have the line set up. And they're united in an offensive purpose and a defensive purpose. They're offensive because they're ready to proclaim what is true, regardless of the consequences. And they're defensively well-ordered because they're ready to defend against these false attacks. That's important. And then Paul said, you're strong in Christ. That's what he means when he said, the strength of your faith in Christ. Remember, faith means to be fully convinced. They're very fully convinced that Christ is Lord and the Son of God. They're unmoving. They're firm. So they're shoulder to shoulder and you can't push through them. They're like a riot shield line that the, the crowd cannot get through. The, the people in Colossae are so convinced of the truth of Christ that you can't deceive them. That's what we need to be. They're not going to be tossed around by various doctrines. You know, oh no, Jesus is this. No, Jesus is that. No, Jesus plus this. They're going to know that the real Christ is none of those things. And their emotions will not cause them to react in a way that's spontaneous, that would take their eyes off of Christ and off of the mission. So Paul is saying, you are prepared for what is to come. You're prepared for the onslaught that is about to take place. You're in a great place and a great position. Now, church today, people in this room, you are prepared for this. You are prepared to be soldiers of Christ, to be born again servants of Christ, to be saints of Christ, to be God's children. And if you think that spiritual warfare is something that is just in the scriptures that you'll never experience, no offense, but you're deceiving yourself. Every time you don't put Christ first in your life, you are submitting to spiritual warfare. And that's everybody in this room, including myself. Our part, not even our part, that's the wrong word. Our mission and the thing that Christ is doing in us, that work that he began and he's continuing to complete, is to get us to understand that we need nothing else, we should have nothing else, and we can depend on nothing else but Christ and Christ alone. Today's Halloween, and the Christian church calls it Reformation Sunday because it is about the time that Martin Luther nailed the 95 pieces on the wall. Why? Because people were taking their eyes off of Christ. That was the problem. So today, let's remember that we're prepared for the onslaught. Let's renew our commitment, reform ourselves, repent, and put our eyes on Christ. And then Paul says, look, you know that you've got what it takes, so keep moving forward. That's what he's saying. Keep moving forward. Verse 6, he says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. So just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord. That's the first part. He's saying you've received the power to keep moving forward. Right? Soldiers can't move forward in battle unless they're well equipped, they have training, and they've got the right weapons. As Christians, if we're not in Christ, and we don't know who he is, and we don't have faith, we're already defeated before we start. We're not even getting to the starting line. And they've received Christ, not just in a figurative sense, not just in this ideological sense. It, it's a reality. Mentally, they've received Christ. And so have we. They heard about Jesus, right, from Epaphras. They heard about him, and Epaphras gave them the true tradition handed down to him by Paul, who got it from Jesus himself. And they believed. So they mentally understood, and they believed, and they understood what they believed, and that's what faith is. Faith is not... Again, I say this all the time. I want to remind you, faith is not this mysterious thing like, I hope it'll work out, but maybe it won't. I have no idea. No, faith means you are fully convinced of the truth that you've heard. They've received Christ spiritually. We know that because when we received Christ and we, we ask him to, to forgive us, we're born again. We're a new person. Christ gives us a new heart and a new mind. We're no longer who we used to be, even though we may see with our eyes that we look the same, unfortunately, for people like me, right? I want a new body, too, right? But we are not the same at all. Inside, we are completely different. We are renewed. And listen, we are physically receiving Christ as well. New believers, mature believers, we behave differently 
We do things differently than before we were in Christ. And if you're not, we need to reevaluate ourselves, right? Believers in Jesus do different things than they did before they were in Christ. And listen, here's the most important part that most people miss. You received the Lord. You didn't receive a friend. You didn't receive a helper or a servant or an emergency contact. Like, who remembers, uh, who wants to be a millionaire, right? You phone a friend. You didn't receive that. You didn't receive a partner that's going to be equal 50-50 with you. Or some, like I've said before, some superhero that's there just to get you out of a jam. You received the Lord, a master of your life. He's the ruler of your life. He's the sovereign king of your very existence. He's going to protect you. He's going to sustain you. And he's already redeemed you. Get this. He owns you. In an age of racism conversations and in a world that talks about slavery and the evils of owning another individual, the concept of anything owning another entity is offensive to us. But it's not for Christ. Christ owns you, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. You see, you used to own you, and you messed it up. Your house was a mess. Your siding was falling off. The rafters were coming down. Your house was crumbling and you didn't even know it. You were living in your slop and thought it was great. Christ came and bought you and he renewed you. He renovated you. This old house has nothing on what Christ did in you. Therefore, we, in light of this truth, can abide or stay in Christ and have confidence that we will persevere through all temptations, trials, and hardships. Nothing can take us away from the truth of Christ and the privilege of citizenship that we have in his kingdom. As we keep moving forward, every step we take must be in obedience to Christ's sovereign rule and will for our lives. This obedience is not compulsive or to earn favor or even to earn acceptance. This obedience is involuntary, like our heartbeat. It happens from the indwelling presence of Christ in us and it manifests itself through joyful service to him. Our obedience is not a negative, but rather the great privilege and honor to be under his perfect and holy rule. Our riches and wealth can be defined by getting to do what Christ commands. So in response to that, let us continue to walk in him, as it says in that next part of verse 6. He's the way that we keep moving forward. He's the way. We continue to walk in him, right? We continue. We don't stop. It's not temporary. We don't walk in Christ when we're saved and then take a break, right? Oh, hold on. Let me get off the Christ train. Let me just sit over here for a minute, you know? We walk in him perpetually. Not when it's convenient, but always. When we're busy, we walk in Christ. When we're on vacation, we walk in Christ. When we're bored and it's a mundane part of our lives, it seems like Groundhog Day, guess what we're doing? We're walking in Christ. And we do this so that we're not deceived. Because outside of Christ, we are vulnerable and exposed to the attacks of the enemy. But remember, we need to walk in him. Not beside him. Don't walk beside him. Don't walk in front of him. Don't walk near him or around him. But rather, you've got to walk in him. Clothed in his truth. Clothed in his strength and his power. Be absorbed by the truth and the presence of Christ. We cannot be any closer to him than when we're in him. That's important. And it's where we want to be. If we are truly saved and born again, if we don't want to be in Christ, there's a major malfunction. Major. We want to be in Christ. So what's the battle plan? Keep moving forward. Don't be deceived. How are we going to do it? How are we going to walk in him? Well, first, we have to be rooted, don't we? In verse 7, we have to be rooted or planted. But here's the thing. Like the illustration I gave in the very beginning of the sermon today, he started the process for us. He rooted us in the beginning. He took our unsaved body and rooted us in him. He did all the work. And he's the master gardener. He didn't mess it up. 
He didn't root us wrong. He didn't water us wrong. He did exactly what was right. He rooted us. His word continues to water us. And his spirit is nourishing us. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3 says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The more we immerse ourselves in the truth and love of Christ, the deeper our roots are going to sink in. And the deeper they sink in, the more we're going to yearn for his presence and seek after his gifts of grace, mercy, and love. The result is that we are built up in him and established in the faith, just as we and as the Colossians were taught. So Christ not only planted us, we're not only continually being rooted by being watered by his word, right, and nourished in his spirit, but we're being built like a house. The Greek word implies construction. It's, it's a real thing. It's not ambiguous. It's not abstract. And Christ is doing the building. And he's building us into a spiritual fortress. A spiritual fortress for his kingdom that relies on our relationship with God. And the more we're built up, the more we're established, the more our faith and our relationship with him solidifies. And the bigger we are in Christ, the stronger we are in the spiritual fortress, the enemy's lies and his deceptions bounce right off. And as we are being built, we become established, unmoving in our faith. Jesus tells a parable about someone who builds a house on sand. And how he builds the house and it looks strong and it looks great. And then all of a sudden the floods come. And it wipes away the house, destroys it. But then a wise person builds their house on a rock, on a firm foundation. And then when the winds and the storms come, it buffets the walls. The house feels the effects, but it's there in the end. That's what we need. That's what being established is. It's so secure that we direct everything in our life to the truth of Christ. And this all happens as a result of discipleship. Because remember what it said at the end of verse uh, 7 there. It says, just as you were taught. The role of the church is the teaching part, right? The role of the church is to learn about Jesus, to live about Jesus, and to grow into Jesus. We receive the truth when we're in relationship with one another. At no point in time in the history of the Christian church was it ever set as an example that Christians shouldn't be together in community. In the 21st century, cultural Christianity is the most independent, isolated group of Christians in the history of the world, basically. We meet less than we've ever met. We miss church more than we've ever missed church. We have relationship outside of church with other believers less than we ever have. The liar, the deceiver, is deceiving us by telling us that we can be on our own and that's okay. As long as I have my Bible and my Jesus, I'm good to go. Well, if you're saved, that's true. But you are abdicating, you are forfeiting the privileges, the joys, the helps, and the strength that God is giving you in the church. But my life is so hard right now. It'll be easier if you get with God's people. Am I saying come to church on Sunday religiously and everything will be fine? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you're not gathering with God... God's people, you're not going to get punished for it, but, but you're losing out. You're losing out. We need to be established. And this discipleship does that for us. And Christ's kingdom training plan, the training plan to be a soldier for Christ is one another, like we said. And there are no graduates. You never get to a point where you don't need the church, where you don't need other Christians in your life. It is an ongoing process until we meet the master teacher himself in person. That will be on the day that he takes the breath from your mouth and brings you home to him. Or if we're lucky enough, it's the day we hear the trumpet sound. Amen. That would be awesome. Amen. And established, when all of that happens, we're rooted, we're planted, we're established, we're built up strong. It brings an overflowing gratitude. 
an uncontrollable and an involuntary act of worship with our lives. From our heart, it wells up and it pours out in our praise. It means that our labors become love, our struggles become joy, our trials are really victory, and our suffering is really exalting the Savior. This is what we do when we gather on Sundays, right? This is a mini example. All of us in this room have hardships that we could talk about ad nauseum from the week before. And to each one of us, they're equally as bad. And there's no contest about who struggles more, right? We're all struggling, okay? And when we get together, this is the worship. This is the thanksgiving. This isn't about hearing me speak. This isn't about liking the music. It's about overflowing with gratitude to the one who deserves that gratitude. That's what we get to do, folks, not what we have to do. So be careful. Don't be deceived by worldly ideas about God. But don't worry, because you are strong and faithful. You are. You are strong and faithful. Other churches and believers around the world have your back as you have theirs in spirit. Remember what Paul did. He prayed for them, right? He thought about them. He gave economically. We do that. Because of this, keep moving forward on mission for the kingdom. You have received the priceless gift of Christ in you. Walk in him totally immersed in his presence. He planted you himself. He is building and strengthening you so that you will be fully established in your faith in him. In this state, you cannot fail. You cannot fall. You can only overflow with gratitude for what he has done for you. Worship him. Gather in his name because he's worth it. Your fatigue from the week and stress from your ordeals pales in comparison to his goodness and glorious presence. Be rooted in his truth. Walk in his will. Grow into the new creation he is making you. Let's pray. Lord, this truth is hard, it's beautiful, and it's difficult, but it's true. Jesus, you are the physical embodiment of truth. Lord, help us not to be deceived. Continue to water us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit and your presence and your word. Let our roots grow deep into you, Father. Help us to grow and to walk each day and turn to you for all things. Lord, when, when we feel the burden is too heavy and we can't take another step, we know that we can trust you to lift us up. You said your burden is light and your yoke is easy. Help us to believe that, to be fully convinced. Lord, help us to find joy in one another. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, defend us from what we can't defend against ourselves, sin. Help us to love you more each and every day. Help us to be on mission for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.